My name is Ruth Ayling. I'm a consultant chemical pathologist at Barts Health NHS Trust in London. This involves seven laboratories, including that at St. Bart's Hospital, um, a hospital that was founded over 900 years ago, and at the Royal London Hospital, this blue building you can see here, which was rebuilt just over 20 years ago. The latter has a really large gastroenterology department, which fits very well with my particular interests in gastroenterology and faecal testing. GI disorders are common and represent a diagnostic challenge for even the most experienced gastroenterologist. Symptoms may arise from organic bowel disease with demonstrable pathology, such as inflammation or neoplasia, or from functional bowel disorders, which is associated with symptoms related to the gut, such as pain or change in bowel habit, but without demonstrable pathology. The learning objective for this session is to explore the laboratory and the non-laboratory tests, which can be used to investigate gastrointestinal disorders. The gold standard investigation for many GI problems is endoscopy, which not only affords visual, en, um, enables visualization, but also affords opportunity for biopsy in order to obtain a tissue diagnosis. However, endoscopy is expensive, it's labour intensive and it's unpleasant for patients and can be associated with complications. Laboratory um, testing therefore has an important role in helping to highlight patients whose investigation should be prioritised and indicating those who may be able to be managed without such tests. Laboratory tests can help in various ways. They may provide a diagnosis for example, the demonstration of H. pylori in a patient with symptoms may be all that is required to start treatment. They can provide clinical screening prior to invasive procedures, for example, measurement of serum transglutaminase testing for celiac disease. Um, may a positive indicate the need for more invasive tests and if negative, enable the patient to avoid them. Tests may also assist with detection and assessment of severity of intestinal disorders or provide prognostic information, for example, faecal calprotectin in inflammatory bowel disease. And laboratory tests can also be useful to investigate the wider effects of GI disease, for example, measurement of full blood count, hematenics or vitamins if malabsorption is suspected. When considering biochemical testing, it's perhaps helpful to consider the various sections of the gut and the associated organs in turn. But when investigating patients, because the symptoms tend to be relatively um, nonspecific, the diagnostic net may have to be cast more widely than a single organ. Laboratory testing doesn't have a major impact in diagnosing disorders of the mouth and esophagus, which are predominantly concerned with the mechanical breakdown of food and its propulsion to the stomach. But it is worth remembering that the buccal mucosa is used as um, a site of sampling for genetic testing and that saliva can be used for measurement of drugs and for hormones such as cortisol. The stomach acts as a reservoir for ingested food, where it's mixed with hydrochloric acid, with mucus and pepsin, before being released in a controlled way into the duodenum. The mucosal surface of the stomach is lined by mucus secreting columnar epithelium, with gastric pits that contain the acid secreting parietal or auxintic cells and the pepsinogen secreting chief cells. The stomach also secretes intrinsic factor which binds vitamin B12 and aids its absorption in the terminal ileum. There are various causes of vitamin B12 deficiency, including, of course, deficient intake, but measurement of intrinsic factor antibodies can be helpful in evaluation of pernicious anemia, where the pathology involves autoimmune destruction of intrinsic factor. Before the realization that H. pylori was a major cause of peptic ulceration, measurement of gastric pH and gastric acid secretion was relatively frequent. Now, testing for H. pylori infection is a major investigation to assist a decision to treat with proton pump inhibitors and antibiotics. There are various methods available, 
Samples taken at biopsy can be cultured or examined histologically for the presence of um, organisms. And there are rapid tests available for biopsy samples, which are based on the ability of H. pylori to secrete urease, which hydrolases urea to ammonia, raising the pH of the medium, causing a color change in an indicator dye. Urea breath tests are based on the same principle as the biopsy-based tests, and the most are the most sensitive and specific but are obviously time consuming both for staff and patients. Most testing is performed on faecal samples, but note that they shouldn't be performed within two weeks of PPIs or within four weeks of antibiotics. In a very small minority of patients with peptic ulceration, the cause is unregulated gastrin release from an endocrine tumor, a gastrinoma. This can be isolated or can be part of um, multiple endocrine neoplasia, MEN1. Um, measurement of gastrin can be helpful in making a diagnosis, but note that achlorhydria can also raise um, gastrin and PPIs are a common cause of achlorhydria. It's worth noting too, that other neuroendocrine tumors can also cause GI effects, for example, diarrhea and carcinoid syndrome, in glucagonoma and in vipoma, and gallstones in somatostatinoma. These hormones can be measured if a tumor is suspected, but the assays are confined to a very limited number of specialist centers and really aren't very commonly required. Gastronomas are commonly found in the head of the pancreas, and this CT shows, as the arrow helpfully points out, an enhancing tumor a gastrinoma in the head of the pancreas. The small intestine is predominantly concerned with digestion and absorption of nutrients, and the different food groups are dealt with in a different way. The carbohydrates of nutritional value include poly, oligo, and monosaccharides. Starch is the most plentiful polysaccharide, it's a linear polymer of glucose molecules which are linked together, and it's found in foods such as potatoes, rice, and bread. Its digestion begins in the mouth with the action of salivary amylase, and then in the small intestine, amylase um, from the, within the pancreatic secretions further break down complex carbohydrates. Their further digestion and the digestion of dietary disaccharides is carried out by enzymes located on the membranes of the intestinal epithelial cells. The major dietary disaccharide is sucrose, which is composed of subunits of glucose and fructose. Sources of sucrose include table sugar, processed foods, fizzy drinks, and confectionery. The term dietary fiber is given to complex carbohydrates that can't be digested in the small intestine, and they play an, an important role in normal functioning of the gut by stimulating intestinal function and they affect absorption of other dietary components such as cholesterol. The monosaccharide products of carbohydrate digestion are absorbed via specific transporter proteins in the gut, either the sodium coupled protein known as sodium glucose link transporter, the SLGT1, or by a family of glucose transporter proteins. And this diagram summarizes those processes of carbohydrate digestion, showing the action of amylase and the disaccharidases and the subsequent absorption of the digested product into the bloodstream aided by the transporter proteins. Abnormalities of carbohydrate absorption can be gen congenital or acquired. An example of an inherited disorder is the rare condition of glucose galactose malabsorption. Diagnosis can be made from assessing enzyme activity in the small bowel by looking at biopsy specimens and confirmed by genetic studies looking for mutations of the SLC5A1 gene, which encodes the sodium dependent glucose transporter 1. Treatment is by withdrawing glucose and galactose from the diet 
There are various forms of lactase deficiency, including a rare inherited form, but humans were probably not intended to drink milk after weaning. And the majority of cases of lactose deficiency seem to arise from a gradual age related um, reduction in lactase activity. Damage to the intestinal mucosa, for example, after um, an infection can cause a more acute temporary lactase deficiency. Measurement of reducing sugars in feces and sugar chromatography may be helpful investigations, but the sample does need to arrive in the laboratory promptly and then be frozen because of ongoing bacterial action in the stool. Xylose tolerance tests and hydrogen breath tests used to be performed to look at carbohydrate malabsorption, but they're now no longer widely done because of various limitations associated with the results. A lactose tolerance test can be performed to look at la um, lactose intolerance, and you look at the rise in plasma glucose after an oral lactose load. But a, tri a trial of withdrawal of lactose from the diet now tends to be recommended and obviously can be therapeutic. Dietary fats are large molecules which are generally not water soluble. And this slide shows how they are digested and absorbed. As digestive enzymes are water based, dietary fats need to undergo a process called emulsification in order to become accessible for digestion. Fat digestion begins in the mouth where lingual lipase inhibits the process and initiates the process, sorry. And there's a further small contribution from gastric lipase. Chewing in the mouth and the physical mixing in the stomach helps to disperse the fat molecules. In the intestine, dietary fat is mixed with bile salts. Bile salts have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic aspects, so they're attracted to both water and to fat. They therefore act to emulsify the fat, increasing its surface area presented for digestion. The bile salts cluster around the products of digestion to form structures called micelles, and in this form the fat can get close enough to the microvilli of the intestinal cells to be absorbed. Short and medium chain triglycerides are absorbed directly into the blood. Long chain fatty acids combine with protein to form chylomicrons, which are absorbed into the lymphatic system via lymph vessels called lacteals in the gut. One to three day fecal fat excretion used to be performed as an indicator of fat malabsorption and therefore indirectly pancreatic exocrine function. Although this patient doesn't look as if the collection has created a problem, it was generally not much fun for the patient and very unpleasant for laboratory staff to, to perform. And most labs no longer offer the test. A good history can provide evidence of the existence of fatty stools, which tend to be pale and bulky with a tendency to float and to be hard to flush down a toilet. Measurement of faecal pancreatic elastase is now the first line test for measurement of pancreatic insufficiency. And there are various commercial ELISAs available. In our lab, we recommend a second test to confirm pancreatic insufficiency because um, it obviously means that if a patient has pancreatic insufficiency, they're obviously being um, condemned to pancreatic enzyme replacement. So we ask for a second test, and this is the way that we report our results. We suggest um, that 100 to 200 is suggestive of moderate to mild pancreatic insufficiency. And we say that if it's a first measurement, we suggest to repeat. And we say that full assessment is usually required before committing patients to long-term replacement. And we write a similar comment if the result is suggestive of severe exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. The gold standard test of exocrine pancreatic function are direct invasive tests, um, such as the secretin pancreasymin test, 
This involves placement of a tube into the duodenum and administration of secretin to induce fluid secretion and pancreasymin to stimulate enzyme production. Fluid is withdrawn from the duodenum and then the, um, the content of bicarb and enzymes measured. This test has the greatest sensitivity and specificity, but it's difficult to perform and it's obviously unpleasant for patients and now rarely used in routine practice. It's also possible to measure pancreatic enzymes in blood. Um, this is standard practice in acute pancreatitis where amylase or lipase are measured but it's rarely diagnostic in the investigation of chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic insufficiency. The enzyme trypsin is stored in the pancreas in an inactive form as trypsinogen. In cystic fibrosis, there's blockage of the pancreatic ducts and increased amounts of trypsinogen are found in the circulation. Measuring immunoreactive trypsin um, or IRT on dried blood spots taken from babies aged five to 10 days forms the basis of neonatal screening programs for cystic fibrosis in many countries. Bile acid malabsorption is increasingly recognized as a cause of diarrhea. This may occur where there's compromised bile acid reabsorption, for example, in disease of the terminal ileum. Um, it may occur where there's disease associated with biliopancreatic disorders or where there's excess bile acid synthesis. And one example of where this may occur is in association with metformin. The gold standard test for the diagnosis of bile acid um, diarrhea is the CCAT scan, an imaging investigation involving um, selenium labeled homoturicolic acid. Other tests involve measurement of faecal bile acids or measurement of serum markers, such as C4, which stands for 7-alpha-hydroxy-4-cholestine-3-ione or fibrous growth factor 19, but none of those are particularly widely available at the present time. Dietary protein is broken down into smaller peptides and constituent amino acids. Gastric acid acts to denature the protein, enabling enzymes to act. Pepsin in the stomach initiates the process, which is continued by chymotrypsin and trypsin from the pancreas. Tripeptides, dipeptides and single amino acids enter the enterocytes of the small intestine using active transport systems. Once inside, the tripeptides and dipeptides are all broken down to single amino acids, which are absorbed into the bloodstream. There are several different types of transport systems to accommodate the different types of amino acids. There are no specific tests for protein malabsorption. However, measurement of fecal alpha-1 antitrypsin is used as a test for protein losing enteropathy. An important pathology affecting the small intestine is celiac disease. This is a systemic autoimmune disease triggered by dietary gluten peptides found in wheat, rye, barley, and related grains in a genetically susceptible host. Immune activation in the small intestine leads to villus atrophy and hypertrophy of the intestinal crypts and increased numbers of lymphocytes in the epithelium and lamina propria, as can be well seen in this slide. On the um, left-hand side is normal small bowel, and you can see the villi and the short crypts. On the right-hand side is small bowel in celiac, which shows atrophy of the villi, elongation of the crypts, and intraepithelial lymphocytes. The disease was once thought to be predominantly a European disorder, but it's now recognized to occur worldwide. The disorder can cause distressing abdominal symptoms and also may present sometimes just with features secondary to malabsorption, for example, iron deficiency anemia or vitamin D deficiency. And it's also associated with an increased risk of malignancies.
This is a simplified algorithm for testing for celiac disease. The first line test is measurement of IgA tissue transglutaminase with measurement of total IgA to exclude IgA deficiency as a cause of false negatives. In those who are IgA deficient, other options include measurement of IgA endometrial antibodies, deaminative um, gliadin peptide, or IgA tissue transglutaminase. Um, HLA DQ2 and DQ8 are present in almost all patients with celiac. HLA testing isn't recommended as part of initial investigation, but it can be useful, for example, in children who have very high concentrations of um, IgA TT. G, for example, to avoid biopsy, and in adults who are already on a gluten-free diet and unwilling to undergo gluten challenge as a confirmatory test. Latest guidance suggests that in symptomatic patients who have very high IgA T2G, for example, of the order of 10 times the upper limit of normal, and positive EMA in a second sample who are unwilling or unable to undergo biopsy, a diagnosis of celiac can be made on blood test results alone. The next part of the GI tract is the large intestine, which stores and concentrates food residues until defecation can occur. Mucus is produced by goblet cells within the colon, and this eases the passage of feces through the colon. Some remaining food residues are digested by enteric bacteria which also produce um, vitamin K and some B vitamins. And these vitamins together with water and some electrolytes are absorbed in the colon. Major disease processes affecting the large intestine include inflammatory bowel diseases and colorectal cancer. The laboratory has a significant role to play in the diagnosis of both of these conditions, offering fecal cow protectin as a test for IBD, a measurement of fecal haemoglobin for colorectal cancer. Calprotectin, um, as you can see in this picture here, um, it's a calcium binding protein. Um, it's um, a member of the S100 family derived predominantly from neutrophils. It's found in body fluids in proportion to the severity of any existing inflammation. And in health, its concentration in feces is about six times that of plasma. And it's a useful surrogate marker of GI inflammation. It was first used in the diagnosis of IBD and has a particular role in the differential diagnosis of IBD from IBS, a high result being able to assist in prioritizing endoscopy and a low result enabling some patients to avoid invasive investigations. This table shows pooled sensitivities and specificities from a number of meta-analyses of calprotectin in the diagnosis of IBD. Many manufacturers suggest 50 micrograms per gram as the upper limit of the reference range. And when it was first used, um, a cutoff of 50 was used as the sort of um, level at which patients should be referred for investigation of IBD. But with more confidence in the test, many clinical pathways now suggest 100, 150, or even 200 as the cutoff for um, referral. The pathway that we use suggests urgent referral if the calprotectin is over 200 and a repeat within two weeks if the calprotectin is between 100 and 200 micrograms per gram. And you can see the very high sensitivity for the diagnosis of IBD and um, good specificity. Calprotectin has also been shown to be useful in patients who have a confirmed diagnosis of IBD, and it can be used to avoid multiple endoscopic examinations. IBD is characterized by periods of activity and remission. In the past, disease activity was assessed with clinical symptom scores, but these correlate poorly 
with objective evidence of disease activity obtained from endoscopy. And calprotectin measurement has um, really something to offer here. The achievement of mucosal healing in IBD is associated with improved outcome. And a fecal calprotectin concentration of less than 100 has been suggested as a target for mucosal healing. Fecal calprotectin has been shown to be able to predict relapse, and the knowledge of this can enable intensification of treatment. There are now home monitoring devices, little lateral flow devices, rather like COVID tests, the results of which can be sent through um, a smartphone app to hospital clinicians, which have proved very useful in the care of patients. And they allow sort of remote telephone consultations um, and intensification of treatment without the need for the patient to bring stool tests to hospital or to have um, outpatient consultations within the hospital. Everything can be done remotely, which has really revolutionized treatment of the disease for the patient. The introduction of biological therapies for IBD, such as infliximab, has revolutionized therapy but these treatments are costly and they're not without side effects. Fecal calprotectin measurement can be used to assist in the de-escalation of these therapies. It is important though that those working in the laboratory have a really good understanding of the pre-analytical and analytical aspects involved in analysis of calprotectin in order to be best able to advise clinical colleagues. There's currently no reference material and no standard, no reference method and no standard reference material for calprotectin. And both of those are necessary for appropriate standardization and harmonization of assays. There are a number of different assays. Studies have evaluated the difference between them. And whilst there's good diagnostic performance and good um, qualitative agreement, the quantitative agreement between the assays tends to be poor with up to threefold differences between them. So this means that if you're looking at um, cutoffs from the literature, you can't necessarily apply a numerical cutoff from the literature to the assay that's in use in your own lab. And if you're doing serial monitoring of an individual patient, it should ideally be performed with the same assay. Whilst initially um, studies said that calprotectin was very stable for up to seven days at room temperature, more recent work has shown that it isn't. And ideally storage at room temperature should be limited to three days. It should also be noted that the reference range differs at the extremes of life with very high concentrations being found in neonates and infants. The reason for the high concentration in neonates is probably due to the immaturity of the gut. And in infants, the higher concentrations may well be due to the multiple viral infections that infants get. And these shouldn't be misinterpreted as more serious um, inflammation within their bowel. It's also, there's also evidence that the reference range is slightly higher in the elderly. The laboratory has a lot of other tests to assist in the management of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, measurement of thiopurine methyltransferase or TPMT activity is recommended prior to starting the immunosuppressant azathioprine to identify those patients with deficient activity who are at risk of life-threatening bone marrow suppression and in whom azathioprine is contraindicated. And once patients are established on azathioprine, measurement of azathioprine metabolites can aid dose optimization. For patients on biologic therapy, such as infliximab or adalimumab, measurement of levels and anti-drug antibodies can help tailor therapy. Colorectal cancer is the um, second most common cancer amongst men and the third most common cancer amongst women worldwide. The diagram 
on the left here shows how cancers are staged, ranging from early stage one cancers to stage four cancers, where there's metastatic spread to other organs. And the graph on the right shows the survival at the different stages. For this reason, screening programs for colorectal cancer are in place in many countries to try and ensure that cancers are detected early to aid survival. Some programs advocate screening using colonoscopy, but perhaps understandably take up of colonoscopy in patients without symptoms tends not to be very high. Guayac um, based fecal occult blood tests have been used for screening programs. And these tests are based on the peroxidase activity of heme. The test card is impregnated with guayac when hydrogen peroxide is added. If heme's present, the guayac's oxidized to a blue colored quinone as shown here. False positives can occur. Um, if you've had a, a good red meat meal, then there can be heme in your gut and that can um, cause the test to be positive. And certain fruit and veg have um, peroxidase activity and that can also influence the test result. And because of this lack of sensitivity and specificity, these tests are being replaced by more accurate fecal immunochemical testing or FIT based programs, which measure fecal hemoglobin using immuno immunological based tests to human globin. Various cutoffs are in place for FIT, largely determined by the capacity of hospital services to cope with the colonoscopy demand and they can range from 10 micrograms per gram to the 120 micrograms per gram on the screening service used in England. In 2017 in the UK, FIT was recommended for use in primary care in symptomatic patients in specific circumstances. But during the pandemic, it was mandated prior to all referrals for colonoscopy to assist triage. And it's now being requested together with calprotectin in many patients when both tests may not actually be required. We use the OC Sensopledia, which is this machine here, um, which measures fecal haemoglobin using a latex agglutination immunoturbidimetric assay. The company have recently produced a calprotectin assay, which can be run on the same sample as FIT. It uses this specimen collection device, which is shown where the patient collects the sample at home. And we're doing some developmental work at the moment, wondering whether we would be able to introduce an algorithm based on the patient's age and the nature of the initial result to determine whether the patient gets one or both tests. I'd now like to discuss some patients who illustrate use of laboratory tests in gastroenterology. The first is a 26 year old woman, a healthcare professional who um, presented to outpatients with a six month history of diarrhea. She complained that her bowels were opening up to seven times a day, which was interfering with her work and her social activities, but she appeared reasonably well and hadn't lost weight. Her investigations to date were unremarkable. Um, full blood count, general biochemistry and CRP were all within reference for intervals. Her fecal calprotectin was less than 50 micrograms per gram. She'd had a urine laxative screen, um, which had tested for bisacodyl, anthroquinones, phenolphthalein and senna and was negative for all. She'd undergone colonoscopy and biopsy and a small and an MRI scan looking specifically for evidence of small bowel Crohn's disease, and they were all normal. Clinical colleagues contacted the lab laboratory and said, is there anything else you can think of that might help? In situations like this, it's sometimes helpful from an investigative point of view to think of diarrhea as either osmotic or secretory. Osmotic diarrhea, is due to the ingestion of poorly absorbed ions, for example, magnesium, phosphate, or sulfate, which are often contained in laxatives or 
antacids or to sugars or sugar alcohols such as sorbitol or xylitol, which are in low sugar foods or to lactose in those with intolerance. Secretory diarrhea is due to disruption of epithelial um, electrolyte transport. Osmotic diarrhea will reduce on fasting in contrast to that which is secretory in nature. And the causes of secretory diarrhea, I've listed a few there, um, most of which in this patient had been excluded. It can be helpful in differentiating between the two to calculate the fecal osmolar gap. This is calculated as twice the fecal sodium and potassium content taken away from 290. Um, 290 is used rather than measuring the actual measured fecal osmo because the measured fecal osmo tends to reflect bacterial metabolism in vitro rather than the intraluminal osmo and a gap more than 75 millimoles per litre suggests an osmotic cause. So in this patient, the faecal sodium was 25 millimoles per litre, the potassium was 15 millimoles per litre, and the magnesium was very high at um, 117, the sort of usual being less than about 45. And this gave a gap of 110 um, that should be millimoles, not nanomoles per litre. And this was suggestive of an osmotic diarrhea and suggested to us the use of a magnesium containing laxative. I've said that to measure a gap, you use the arbitrary figure of 290 rather than measuring the faecal osmo. It can sometimes be helpful to measure faecal osmo to further evaluate the samples. Samples may appear liquid, but a sample with a very low osmo may have been contaminated with water, and sample with a very high osmo may have been mixed with a concentrated urine. And you can always check that by measuring the urea concentration. So our, our um, patient had um, a, a gap suggestive of osmo, and a high magnesium content. This was gently put to the patient by the clinical team and she admitted to some underlying issues relating to her childhood and these were appropriately addressed and her diarrhea resolved. So the lab here was integral to making the diagnosis where other investigations had failed. The second patient was a 49 year old man who had a short history of bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. A faecal calprotectin was performed in general practice, which was raised at 568, so above the cutoff of 200, where an urgent referral to the hospital was recommended. He was referred urgently, um, had a colonoscopy, which was normal. Um, on questioning, his symptoms had now completely resolved. Um, and it was noted that his partner had been diagnosed with Campylobacter in the week that he had become ill. Um, it should be noted at this point that um, fecal calprotectin is a surrogate marker of GI inflammation, not of inflammatory bowel disease. And it's not generally helpful to measure. Um, calprotectin in very acute gastrointestinal disturbance. And it sort of depends on the time course. He was referred urgently, but there was presumably a lag between the referral and the colonoscopy, by which time um, he had a sort of acute infection, which had then resolved and his colonoscopy was normal. So normally we suggest that fecal calprotectin is done for a more chronic diarrhea, perhaps where symptoms have been in place for about four weeks rather than a very hyperacute infection. Um, and the third patient was a 51 year old male who was referred to the neurology clinic with ataxia. He had a known history of celiac disease, but it didn't seem to bother him very much. And he, he didn't really stick to his diet and didn't bother to go to 
um, his follow up appointments with the dietitian because he didn't feel that um, the celiac was really an issue. The neurologists did the usual gamut of tests that they do in patients with um, ataxia. And these showed um, that the patient was anemic with a low ferritin, a low B12, a low vitamin D, a vitamin A at the lower end of the reference range and a strikingly low vitamin E, which was thought to be the cause of his ataxia. He was supplemented with all the nutritional um, things that were low and particularly with vitamin E and his ataxia resolved. So it's interesting that um, symptoms of malabsorption may be predominantly of a deficiency of a single dietary component. So in this gentleman, his, um, he didn't seem particularly bothered by diarrhea and he presented with ataxia. So in summary, GI conditions include a whole spectrum, both of organic disorders with pathology and functional disorders where symptoms are present and um, there's no demonstrable pathology. And it's very difficult without investigations to differentiate those. Many GI tests are invasive and laboratory investigations are helpful to prioritize patients that require invasive investigations and enable other patients to avoid them. And tests can be used to assist diagnosis in the management of disease and increasingly in the choice and monitoring of treatment. I've listed some um, further reading if you're interested. The first is just a general chapter on um, clinical biochemistry of the GI tract. The second is an article on calprotectin. The third are some very useful guidelines on investigation of chronic diarrhea from the British Society of Gastroenterology. And the fourth is um, a useful recent article on fecal immunochemical testing. Thank you very much for your attention.